A kingdom man takes responsibility for those whom God has entrusted into his care. He understands that his family is his responsibility to care for, to love, and to provide for. We see what happens when kingdom men are absent from the home. Ah, but when a kingdom man shows up, his family knows that they are in a safe place. Some time ago, I had a problem in my house. On my bedroom wall, a crack had appeared. This crack on the wall was just this ugly crack, and I needed it to get repaired. I needed it to get patched up. And so I called a, a painter over and asked him would he rectify the problem of this uh, crack in the plaster on my bedroom wall. He removed the old plaster and then put up new plaster, repainted it, it looked brand new. I paid him. He went home. All seemed well. But about a month later, the crack reappeared. Somewhat spiritually ticked off since I'd already paid this guy. <laughs> I called him back and I said, I got another crack in the same place on my wall. Oh, he said, boy, I'm sorry. Let me come back over and, and uh, fix it up. So he came back and he redid it. Looked fine to me and all seemed well. About 45 days later, the crack reappeared, but this time with its nieces, nephews, uncles, aunts, and cousins. I had a whole family of cracks that had made themselves at home on my bedroom wall. So I figured what I needed was a new painter. I needed someone else who like really knew what they were doing. So I called another guy over and said, can you fix my problem? He stared at my cracks on the wall and stared and stared and stared. And then he looked at me and he said, um, no, no, I can't fix your problem. I said, what? He said, I, I can't help you. I said, but, but isn't this what you do? He says, I, it is what I do, but I can't help you. I said, why not? He said, because you don't have a problem with cracks on your wall. So I looked at the cracks on my wall I was not having a problem with. <laughs> then I looked back at the crack in front of me who was telling me <laughs> I was not having a problem with cracks on my wall. So I said, now, now wait a minute. I said, now, now, I said, I see a crack. You see a crack. All God's children see a crack. There's, there's a crack on this wall. And then that's when he said it. He said, oh, yeah, there's a crack on the wall. All I'm telling you is that that's not your problem. He says, sir, your problem is you have a shifting foundation. He says, the foundation under your house is moving. What you're looking at that you think is the problem is not the problem. It's the symptom of the problem. He says, until you solidify the foundation of your house, you will forever be doing patchwork on the cracks on your wall. Nothing demonstrates the decline of our world today like the demise of the family. Our houses have all these cracks in them. They're divorce cracks, they're neglect cracks, they're abuse cracks, they're debt cracks, and it can get so bad it can be crack cracks. But there is this invasion of the destruction of our home. 50% of all marriages, including Christian marriages, end in divorce. And the largest percent of the other 50 live together, even though they're not particularly happy, but they stay because of kids and finances. Marriage and family is on the decline. And we've already seen the statistics, but we're spending a lot of, personal money, government money, to patch up cracks on the wall. And for a while, they appear to be patched up and things look okay, only to discover, give it enough time, and the cracks just keep on reappearing. We want to talk about the kingdom man and his family. We've looked at the kingdom man personally. He fears God. The first group that ought to know that you take God seriously, isn't the church house, it's your house. 
the first group that ought to know you're a kingdom man is your own heart. If they don't know it, then it doesn't matter what everybody else thinks about it. You ought to be a kingdom man at home first. The saga of a nation is the saga of its families written large. As we've already said, the first concern should not be the White House, it should be your house. And what you are doing to make your home a kingdom place. Let's look at how the home was established. Let's start there. God, before he ever created Adam or Eve, said, let us make man in our own image and let us, the Trinitarian God, let us bless them and give them dominion over the whole earth. So before he created man, he said, we're going to create male and female and we're going to set them up to subdue the earth, have dominion or to rule with authority. That's what dominion is. It is to have rule with authority. We're going to give it to them, but here is how we're going to give it to them. We're going to give it to them male and female. The man is going to be the lead because there was an order in creation. He created Adam before Eve. He is to lead, but he's not to do it alone. Dominion must happen with male and female once the man is married. God structured it so that he put Adam to sleep and performed surgery on him by taking out his rib and fashioned a woman. The Bible says he made man, but he like took time and fashioned a woman. And we're all glad he did. Uh, but that meant Adam lost something in order to have a woman. He had to give up something. He had to give up. He became half the man he used to be. He, he gave up a side. So in order to get a woman, or let me say it another way, in order to get his rib back, he had to be willing to take on more than the rib he lost. He lost a rib. So if you want your rest of you that you lost back, you're going to get other ingredients that have been added to the rib that you didn't have when you lost your rib. So when a man gets a wife, he's not just supposed to have what he had. He's supposed to have what he did not have, which is why she's called in Genesis a helper, because she was supposed to bring to the table that which the man did not have have of his own, but also complete what man lost. So whenever a woman is left out of the kingdom equation, you limit or even cancel God's involvement with you. What most men don't understand is when she is not a collaborator, but is merely viewed as a companion, a cook, a dishwasher, a cleaner, and a child bearer, but not a collaborator, then the purpose for establishing marriage and the family has been lost because the purpose of a woman was to collaborate, that is, become a helper in the dominion covenant, to become a helper in the expansion of God's kingdom in history. God created the family, listen to this, not first of all, for you to be happy, not first of all, for you not to live alone. Those are bonuses. He created a family in order to expand his rule in history. When you lose sight of the kingdom and you're only thinking about, well, uh, happiness and feeling good and all of that, then you have dumbed down the reason for why he started it in the first place. God is a trinity. He's a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And guess what? These three are one. So he takes the rib out of the man, creates a woman, tells them they should become one flesh. Then he creates a process by which the woman can bear a child that has the DNA of the mother and father, and he brings them together as a Trinitarian unit, man, woman, and child, so that he can have on earth a trinity. 
So what God was creating in family was creating a trinity so that a trinity could operate on earth like he operates in heaven in order to expand his purposes in history. So guess what you get to oversee as a man? You get to oversee the role of the father in bringing the members of the trinity together in order to demonstrate heaven in the midst of hell. You are to expand God's kingdom. That's why Satan went to the woman. He wanted to reverse the roles. He wanted to put her in charge, make her the lead, and create chaos in the relationship. The first persons who ought to know that you are a kingdom man is your family, starting with your wife. He says in verse 3 of Psalm 128, your wife shall be like a fruitful vine within your house. Why? Because you fulfill verses one and two. You fear God. And because you fear God, your wife is going to flourish in your house. We're talking about fixing the foundation. And to fix the foundation of, the mar of, of a family, you've got to fix the marriage. Marriage in the Bible is called in Malachi 2.14 a covenant. It is not merely a social contract. A covenant was a spiritually binding relationship brought about by God over which God ruled. That's why God created the man, God created the woman, and then God brought the woman to the man because he was going to oversee this whole process. People get married in church because they want God to get it started even though they want to leave him in church while they go on the honeymoon. What he says is, I want this, the fear of God, to be part of the marriage covenant. But we live in a day when marriage is taken lightly. It's, uh, it's thrown away easily. Uh, one man said marriage for him was like a three-wing circus. You know, there was the engagement ring, there was the wedding ring, and now there's the suffering. He just <laughs> thought it was a, you know, one man said, I, I was looking for the ideal, and it became an ordeal, and so I want a new deal. And so, so, so men have become dissatisfied with marriage. They've become dissatisfied with the relationship. And that shows up in so many different kind of ways. One man was on an airplane and he was flying. And as he was flying, he, uh, he noticed the guy sitting next to him had his wedding ring on his right hand. He said, sir, are you married? He said, well, yeah, I'm married. He says, well, you have your wedding ring on the wrong hand. He said, uh-uh, I married the wrong woman. See, <laughs> many people feel like they married the wrong woman when what we have to understand is he says your wife shall become a fruitful vine. In other words, she may not be that right now. She may be sour grapes right now. But he says when a man becomes a kingdom man and he fears God, changes will begin to occur in his wife. She will become something she was not. So if your wife is not what she should be, what you want her to be, assuming what you want her to be is legitimate, then the problem may be, see, you are a thermostat, she is the thermometer. You're supposed to set the temperature, she's supposed to show you to read. So she's supposed to let, see, if you want a summer wife, you can't bring home winter weather. You've got to create an environment in which she can flourish. It says, she shall become a fruitful vine within your house. Now, that's a grape vineyard, a fruitful vine. A grape vineyard becomes fruitful when three things happen. First of all, it must cling. If you go to Napa Valley, California, you go to all the grape vineyards, you will see the vines tied up on posts because if they're not, they'll drag on the ground. And if they drag on the ground, they won't get full sunlight and won't get the benefit of the nourishment of the vine. So they lift them up. They elevate them so that they are high, so they cling and are made secure on the post. When they are secured on the post by clinging, then they're free to climb. That is, they spread on the post. Because they are stable and secure, clinging on the post, they're free to climb along the post. When they climb along the post, then they begin to cluster on the post. So once they are secured to cling, they begin to climb so that they now cluster and you've got bunches of grapes. These grapes are squeezed to become grape juice. Grape juice is fermented to become wine. And you know what wine will do? It'll make a sad man glad. See, what he is saying is, when you create a stable environment 
based on your fear of God, your wife becomes secure. She will begin to flourish so that she begins to cluster so you can become intoxicated on her love. What he is suggesting to you today is that she can be turned into something she is now not because of your fear of God being applied in the home because you're a kingdom man at home. You're not just a kingdom man at church. You're a kingdom man in the house. And she becomes, Paul talks about uh, this whole concept of the role of a husband. And he says, a man should be his wife's savior. He says in Ephesians 5 that uh, just as Christ uh, uh, died and sacrificed for the church, uh, we are to love our wives that way. We are to love them as a savior. Now, the last time I checked, you only need a savior if you've got to help a sinner. In other words, you don't need a savior unless somebody needs saving. So if your wife is not all she's supposed to be, she has a savior. We're not all we're supposed to be. We have a savior. And what does the savior do? He sacrificed. Jesus Christ died on the cross. He gave up something to gain us. If you make a list of all you do for your wife and you make a list of all she does for you, if her list is longer than your list, she the savior. You should be out serving her because you're the savior. Last time I checked, if you have a savior, you have a cross. Jesus Christ died on the cross. I had a man for me say to me one day, my wife's killing me. I said to him, you said you wanted to be like Jesus, didn't you? <laughs> okay. In other words, there is a cost to being a savior. There is a cost to being a savior. A man is to love his wife like Christ loved the church who gave himself up for her. And then he goes on and says he is to be her sanctifier. You are to sanctify her, Ephesians 5 says. Sanctification is taking somebody from where they are and turning them into what they ought to be. It is the process of change that takes place. When you were converted, you entered into a process of spiritual development to change you. God wants to change you. That process is called sanctification. He says a man is to sanctify his wife or he is to oversee her change. Sanctification involves investment so that a person becomes. When, see, when you met your wife, you did not see all that was there to be seen. Because uh, she didn't tell you everything about her. And even though you learned a lot, you didn't learn everything because if you knew then what you know now, you might not have married her. So she ain't going to let you see everything. But over time, you said, I didn't know she was like this. I didn't know you were like this. You said, no, she was always like that. She just hid that from you while you were dating. She, she was. No, your, pro your process is to see that change takes place. And that change takes place by a kingdom man using kingdom principles with God at the top, investing in his wife, in his marriage, and in that relationship. Then he says, you're to be your wife's satisfier. He says, a man ought to love his wife like he loves his own body. The principle is simple. Everything you do for you, see if you can do two of them. In other words, you're thinking about her every time you're thinking about you so that it's never only about you. When she discovers she's that valuable, when she discovers she's that meaningful, when she discovers, you don't just ask her to cook, you ask her for her ideas on your direction. When she discovers, you don't just ask her to clean, but you ask her for her input on a major decision that has to be made about the family. You get to make the final decision because you're the head, but you are to never make the final decision without full input. Why? Because when God brought you back your rib, he brought you back some other ingredients that he wants to be put into equ equation. Her intuition, her feelings about things. Her, you're so emotional. Well, that was supposed to be value add for the man because we may not feel it. We may just think it and logic our way through it. But he's saying, don't ignore the feelings because the feelings may have information that you don't pick up naturally that is critical to the decision. When she discovers that she is necessary and not just an add-on 
an addendum, a sexual partner, but she is critical for her mind, her feelings, her thought, and her contribution, guess what you get to have? Dominion. That means you get to take things over. You get to see God move. He will not operate independently of her. In addition to that, Peter says in 1 Peter 3, 7, that if a man is in conflict with his wife, tell the man don't pray, God's not listening. Mm -hmm. So if you are operating not as a kingdom man, God says, I am not listening if your wife is not part of the equation. So this marriage thing isn't just about being happy, it's about God paying attention to you because the two were made one. He then goes on from marriage and he goes to the children. He says, your children will be like olive plants around your table. Not olive trees, olive plants. It takes 15 years for an olive plant to become an olive tree. It takes 15 years. But if you nurture it right, it'll produce olives for 2,000 years. If you go over to Israel, you can go to the Garden of Gethsemane and they have 2,000 year old olive trees still pumping out olives because their roots run deep. We have a crisis with our children today and that is because their roots don't run deep because nobody's overseeing them. When I go through the airport, I have to go through a magnetometer as you do. I will walk through and it will go beep, 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 beep. I got metal in my pocket. I got to go back and empty my pockets. So usually it's my keys. I put my keys in and walk through. But sometimes I'll have my keys in my pocket, walk through the magnetometer, and uh, there's no beeping. Why does it beep sometimes when I have keys in my pocket and not beep other times? Because magnetometers have to be set. And you can set them at different levels of sensitivity. So based on who set them and at what sensitivity level, that will determine whether they go off or not. We have a generation of young people today whose consciences don't beep. And the reason they don't beep is nobody has set them. The father is not in the home setting the conscience, the, the, the value system, the rights and wrongs for the children. So they're getting it from uh, BET and MTV and they're getting it from the movies and they're getting it from the peer groups and they're getting it from a continuing secular society. And we're wondering why they are acting like they are acting. They're acting like they are acting because their roots are not running deep. You say, but how do you do this as a man? And as a father, in a world where fatherlessness is the norm, he tells you in this verse, he says at the end of verse three, your children will be like olive plants. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Around your table. The way a man leads his family in the Bible is around the table. The table is the place for kingdom men to take charge. That is when you sit down with the family and the leader takes over. This is where you sit down with the family and you train the children. You make sure the homework's being done. You make sure the housework is being done. You ask the wife, are there any issues with any of the kids that I need to address? And you do that at the table, which means that you don't need extra time to lead your house, but you do have to be at the table. See, a Jewish father was at the table because the table wasn't just for eating. The table was for leading. It was where he led. He just did it around food. So he gathered at the table in order to provide leadership for the family. It's where you cut off the television, you cut off the radio, you gather everybody around the table, and now everybody's looking to dad to lead. At the table is where you review the sermon from Sunday. At the table is where you pray for each child and pray God's protection and blessing. At the table is where you provide disciplinary corrective instruction for the child. At the table. Now, your job may not allow you to be at the table every single day, but you should be at the table every time you can so that it is clear who the head of this house is. It's one thing to say, I'm the head of my house, but how are you going to be the head of your house and never be at the table? 
that creates resentment. That creates uh, animosity because you come in spewing in order, but you're not there to provide spiritual leadership, personal leadership, directional leadership, practical leadership because you're not at the table. He says, your children will become olive plants, which means they're on their way to become olive trees. And over in Israel, olive trees are used for everything. They're used for medicine. They're used for eating. They're used for massages. They're used for everything because they're designed to show what it looks like when boys have been raised up to become men who are impacting their world. He says the family is the key. And that is why it is so important what Joshua says in Joshua chapter uh, 24, verse 15, he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. See, that's what a kingdom man says. He didn't ask for a vote. He didn't ask his wife, what you think? You think I ought to do this? Because there is no vote when it comes to the kingdom because the king has already voted. He says, as for me and my house, this is how we roll. He says, I can't tell you and your house what to do, but as for me and my house, this is how we roll. And you bring your presence to bear on the family because whoever owns the family owns the future. Satan is not trying to destroy the family just to make people unhappy. Satan is trying to destroy the family because he's trying to kill the future. Our future is being destroyed because our families are being destroyed. But our families are being destroyed because kingdom men aren't leading them anymore. We are now leaving them to raise themselves or mothers who do the best they can with what they have. But a mother on her best day still can't be a father. She can be a great mother. She can be an exceptional mother. But there are some things that only a man can bring to a boy. And there are some things our daughters need to hear from all you so that they're not believing some smooth talking fool who whispers in her ear and lies to her and destroys her life. That means your presence must be felt. As for me and my house, this is not a negotiation. As for me and my house, this is not something that we're taking uh, carelessly. As for me and my house, God rules here. Why? Because we want to see his dominion. We want to see what happens when our whole family prays about a matter. I remember one time we were, uh, uh, we went, took our kids to the Grand Canyon on vacation. I, I'm still trying to figure out why we could go across country to see a hole in the ground. But we went to the Grand Canyon. And uh, when we went to the Grand Canyon, uh, I had forgotten to make a hotel reservation. That is not good. Because if you don't get one of the hotels at the Grand Canyon, at least then, then you drive to drive an hour to an hour and a half to get a hotel. I forgot to make a reservation. And so we're sitting there. I arrive at midnight. No reservations. I stand in line with a whole lot of other people who are trying to get reservations. No rooms are available. So they're mad at me. I'm telling them don't talk to me because <laughs> I'm mad at me and, 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 and because I forgot to make reservations. So the dining room was still open. So we wanted to get something to eat before we went to search for a hotel close, uh, and now it's close to midnight. We're sitting around the table eating. My daughter Priscilla looks up and she says, Dad, we're all here at the table and you taught us when we have an issue, we should pray about it as a family. And we haven't prayed about our hotel situation. I ain't wanna hear that. <laughs> I don't need you telling me to pray. And you're going to be telling me what to do. You know? So I said, you pray. You know, because I was, you know, I was, wasn't in the mood for prayer. Okay? She said, okay. She said, and so Priscilla, my daughter, she said, Lord, we're here all together as a family. And we've been taught to call on you when we're in emergency. And we've got this emergency, Lord. And uh, we don't have a place to stay. And we're just Pray that you protect us, but that you provide us a place to stay. In Jesus' name, amen. As she said amen, I said, okay, now let's get practical. All right, what are we going to do? Because we're in a real world and we don't have a hotel room. The man behind the desk comes over to our table and he says, well, you one of the family looking for a room? We said, well, yeah. Well, one of our folks just had an emergency. A room just came open. The people that were ahead of you are no longer here. You're the first one I run into. Do you still want a room? I, I told him, don't y'all look at me. Don't, don't look at me. Don't look at me. What the table does 
is give you dominion. It gives you the right to rule, to call things into being, to reshape things. And that's why he wants to divide the marriage and bring you in conflict with the kids because he wants to see the family destroyed so he can kill the future. The future of a community, the legacy of your life. He wants to kill the country by destroying the family. You go home as kingdom men and say, God has already instructed me. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Under this roof, this is how we live.